This is At Ease, the military podcast of Thomas Nelson Community College. I'm Gary Pounder, part of the military team here at TNCC, and on this edition of the pod, we're going to be talking about an event that is coming up here in middle June, and we're, we're referring to the Virginia Women Veterans Summit 2021 event that's been going on now for a number of years, been held virtually for the past couple of years, obviously due to the restrictions put in place by COVID-19. And here to discuss the uh, summit with us and to talk about other services for female veterans offered by the Virginia Employment Commission, which puts on the summit every year, we have three ladies. First of all, we have Paige Glass, who is the Eastern uh, Veteran Regional Manager with the VEC. We also have Tashambi Hall. Tashambi Hall is the local lead employment representative with the uh, VEC. And finally, we have Bev- Beverly Van Toll, who is a, a Department of uh, Veteran Services Program Manager for the past five years. Ladies, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, join us here on the podcast. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Great to have you here. Uh, Paige, I'm going to start with you. I should point out that all three of you ladies are veterans of the U.S. Army or the Army Reserve. So, Paige, tell us a little bit about your background, your experience in the Army, and how all that led you to the VEC. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Again, uh, my name is Paige Glass. Uh, I am an Army veteran, uh, ten and a half years. Uh, I uh, basically started um, in logistics uh, in the military, and I ended up with logistics and um, admin. Uh, I I loved what I did. Um, My tenure there, like I stated, uh, ended up getting a medical discharge. I came to the Virginia Employment Commission office, I want to say back in 2000. Uh, I I came under the um, apprenticeship as a work-study student uh, under Ted Watts at the time on Fort Eustis. Uh, I was also in the process of going to school uh, to get my bachelor's degree in human resources. So I started working as a work-study student at the uh, Virginia Employment Commission uh, through the Department of Veterans Affairs. So I did approximately eight eight months as a work-study student, and and Ted at the time uh, told me to try to apply for some positions uh, with the Virginia Employment Commission. So I did. I tried several times. You know, if you don't see the first time, you continue to try. So I came through the Virginia Employment Commission as a work-study student. Uh, So that's how I started my journey at the Virginia Employment Commission. So within eight months, I became uh, classified uh, with the Virginia Employment Commission office. And I've been with the Virginia Employment Commission office now going on 19 years. I came up through the ranks as a wage personnel, uh, a wage personnel as a workforce service representative. Then I started as a 50-50, as they call a workforce service representative and a local veterans employment representative. So I had both worlds, working with unemployment and working with the veterans. And then they did away with the 50-50 position. And then they just made me permanent as a, a lever at that time. And that's the local veterans employment representative. I want to say about five years now, I program did a rehaul. Uh, we came under a new management. And at that time, I threw my hat in to become one of the regional managers for the actual uh, JBSG program. And that's where I'm currently at now. I am the Eastern Regional Manager with the uh, Jobs for Veterans State Grant Program. Uh, my territory ranges from the Eastern Shore to South Hill, Virginia, under the leadership of Dr. Robert Walker, Jr. So I, I love what I do. I have a passion to work with veterans from every capacity, whether they are from World War II or, or currently. Uh, so I do have a passion dealing with veterans. That passion is very obvious in just, you know, the short conversation we've had here so far. Just curious, obviously, the eastern part of Virginia is very, 
military heavy in terms of population. Just curious, uh, with the various reps and offices that are under your purview with the VEC, how many veterans do you serve a year? That would be, I know we serve over a thousand and some a year, and that's just an approximate estimation. Uh, but we, we, we continue to serve, in, even in COVID, we, we continue to, to serve. So I would say approximately over a thousand a year in, in different capacities, in different formats. And you folks do a really fine job. We're also going to be speaking with Tashambi Hall. Tashambi is also with the uh, VEC, and she's also, again, as we said earlier, a local lead employment representative working with veterans. Tashambi, you obviously also have a military background. We discovered before we began taping here today that you and I were members of the military intel community at one time. So tell us about your background, your experience in the Army Reserve, and you know, how that kind of led you on to your current position with the VEC. Okay. I started off, um, I joined the military while in college. Um, I was attending John C. Smith University at the time, and I was in the ROTC program there. So I just said, well, if I can do ROTC, why not do the actual military? So I joined, and um, which led me to moving uh, into North Carolina, and uh, that's where my unit was based. Uh, however, you know, we were activated more than reservists, so uh, being in Intel, um, finally ended up as a 42 Alpha, which is a human resources representative. Um, my military career provided me an opportunity to travel. Um, I am a military brat, so actually I'm the first, uh, excuse me, second female, because I learned recently that one of my aunts who recently passed away was uh, a nurse in the military, in the Army. Um, so I'm the second female in my family to join. Um, and then uh, traveling and getting to new to know new people. And when I I got out of the military on a military a medical discharge as well, um, I stayed in North Carolina for a while. Then I went to Florida, and Florida is where my second venture with uh, serving veterans was. Um, I did work in the one stop in North Carolina as a vet rep um, under the, now it's called WIOA, but it was WIA uh, program back then, uh, where I was the rep who assisted all the veterans with going through the process. And then in Florida, I was a homeless veteran case manager. And then um, while there, I had my, my miracle child. Mm -hmm. And then we decided to move to Virginia to keep him closer to his great grandparents who were closer to their 90s and are, you know, I wanted him to have that relationship with them. And uh, while here, I started off with um, VDOT and the Human Resources Department. And my passion for veterans was still yearning. I, I wanted to serve more. So when the position with um, the Employment Commission came open for a DVA, a Disabled Veteran Outreach Program Specialist. Um, I applied for that and um, was hired. And within the last couple of weeks, I was promoted to my current role, which is the lo local lead employment representative. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, you mentioned that uh, you came into the Army, Army Reserve through ROTC. Where did you do ROTC at? at Johnson C. Smith University. Oh, very good. Very good. Now, I got to ask, you know, again, as a former Intel type, uh, you're training in the Army Intel program at Fort Huachuca in Arizona? No. <laughs> you didn't make <laughs> it there? Fort Huachuca. Okay. They sent um, most of us to um, Monterey, California. Oh, okay. Oh, you were doing the <laughs> language, the language part. I understand. <laughs> understand. Yeah. A lot of Army Intel training for those folks out there scratching their heads going, what in the heck are they talking about? 
is done at a place called Fort Huachuca in southeastern Arizona. I remember in my Air Force career, I had a PCS move to a place called Davis Mothin Air Force Base in Tucson. In Tucson, you know, nice town and everything. And so me and the family, we're driving along Interstate 10. It's pretty desolate, you know, there in, in southeast Arizona. And I see the sign that said Fort Huachuca, next exit. And thought, wow. You know, this is probably a place I would not want to be. However, if you're a student and military wants you to focus on your studies with a lot of, without a lot of outside distractions, I guess Fort Huachuca is probably a pretty good place. So were you actually a linguist in the Army Reserve going through Monterey? Mm-hmm. What was your language? I started off with German. Okay. Very good. Uh, folks don't realize that's a very, very tough program because you literally learn to speak a foreign language fluently in about one year's time. And we're not talking about, you know, English, obviously. We're talking about uh, Russian, Mandarin, German, uh, Serbo-Croat. Yeah, and a lot of them. So congratulations for making it through a program like that. Uh, Beverly Van Toll is also a product of Army ROTC at Howard University in Washington. And I believe you spent something like 14 years in the Army Medical uh, Service Corps before you um, made your way to the Virginia Department of Veterans Services. Tell us about your background, your experience in the Army, and again, how that led you to your current role. Absolutely. And thank you so much for this opportunity. It's it's just phenomenal to be here with my fellow warrior sisters um, and community veteran advocates. Um, so for me, I started um, out of ROTC. I, I was uh, looking for some new and interesting challenges and a really good way to continue to finish my education. Um, and so uh, my first duty station in the Medical Service Corps um, because I was not in the clinical side of the house. So, you know, I got to really take care of a lot of the other sides, like patient administration, some of the medical records and, and release of information. So all of the things that the clinicians need so that they can provide continued care, um, patient access and things of that nature, we were there to support. Um, so it was really an exciting time for me when I came into the military um, really early 2000, right before um, 9-11 hit. I was in uh, Germany when 9-11 hit. So, you know, it was really a different time kind of coming into the military as one of those uh, places to be able to grow and, and really find yourself. Um, I'm a native New Yorker and I'm, I'm, I'm now very uh, excited to be here in a slower pace of life here in Virginia. But when I came into the military, it was really a great opportunity to continue to grow, to learn and to um, really see what I was able to do, not only physically, but as a leader, um, because uh, within, I want to say my first three years in the service, I ended up being able to deploy to Iraq for the first time. So um, I was uh, injured in uh, combat during my second deployment tour and also had to medical discharge. Um, but I got to spend so many years, I got to be a company commander at one of, uh, one of the Fort Hood medical centers. Uh, that was an exciting time. And I really did find my heart in taking care of soldiers, um, their families, uh, military spouses, you know, the guys and the gals that are military spouses. Mm -hmm. um, it was really an exciting time in my career to really grow and, and understand the whole next level of being a soldier, not just, you know, not just the side of the wartime mission, but the peacetime and garrison and really being able to connect with the community because, um, during my time as a company commander, we were able to pioneer some great programs, adopted school programs. We were able to do um, uh, projects with um, adolescents, like kind of boys and girls. So I really got to see a whole other side of the military that wasn't just all about training and, and tactics. And we were able to really engage in a positive way um, in the community when I was a company commander. When I left Texas, um, because I ended up first in Germany, then I went to Texas, and then this was my last duty station here at Fort Lee, Virginia. Um, and I was able to work uh, with some of the phenomenal health professionals at the Kenner Army Health Clinic. There's some, still a, a lot of really good friends of mine that are out there doing great things, supporting um, 
the new trainees and uh, the families here in Virginia. So it was just excited to be able to take my career to the next level, grow as a patient administrator, understand the importance of, you know, medical reg regulations, laws, rules, and that's uh, part of uh, the community, military medical health, uh, healthcare um, is really a, a, a part of the community that I was able to help um, kind of pioneer with when as I was transitioning out. So even though I wasn't able to stay in for the whole 20, as I was transitioning out, um, there were some new <clears throat> initiatives that were coming into play in Petersburg, and there was the Freedom Support Center that was um, being built up and, and brought to life uh, by, I think, two previous governors, and I was able to be a part of that project where we were able to build a collaborative healthcare and community resources center where it was kind of a one-stop shop for all veterans. Um, my transition was a little rocky, so I kind of glossed over it. I had to become a veteran entrepreneur to actually get employment, so I didn't know about the phenomenal services at the Virginia Employment Commission or at the Virginia Department of Veteran Services. As I was transitioning, transitioning out as an officer, um, there were just a, a lot of assumptions and there were a lot of things that um, I didn't realize were pivotal things that would have been able to help me with my transition. So it was a little rockier. So once I got out, I had to engage um, creating new opportunities. And there's a lot of women veterans that go through that same thing um, and go into entrepreneurship. And for me, it was entrepreneurship and healthcare advocacy. So I actually connected with a local um, healthcare uh, facility um, that actually has healthcare, uh, has health hospitals all over Virginia, Maryland, Kentucky, and some other states. And they started, I was able to help them start their first military uh, military veteran community navigator program and connected them um, to the veteran communities, family members, and providing health care, education, and services in the community. Um, so the interesting thing was I kind of stumbled into that and then found my heart just really stationed in not really the consultancy work, but really the advocacy work the for the veterans, the veteran families, and then of course other women veterans, because I just continued to see that I was not helping as many women um, and their, their, their families really get connected. Um, and that's when I was introduced to, to the uh, VEC, the Veteran Employment Commission, and uh, pretty shortly thereafter, the Virginia Department of Veteran Services, with which I now work, um, and I actually helped them pioneer the program with the Military Medics and Corpsmen program, which is a healthcare industry-based uh, transition program that helps uh, former medics and corpsmen uh, find jobs in the civilian sector. So they use those skill sets that they had in the hospital. They, I mean, they were co combat trained and battle tested, and then they come out of the service and have a problem getting a job because they don't have the, you know, the AMA and some of those um, credentials, LPN or CNA licensure. So we were able to get a uh, Virginia code passed through legislation and allow where we can work with um, pivotal healthcare facilities. You know, there's some healthcare facilities. All of this great information is at www.dvs.virginia.gov, but that's where I got my start. And so as I was helping build that program, I continued to see not as many women veterans being supported or not, and I won't say supported, not as many women veterans coming and seeking the services and support that we had. Um, and then we were able to really start thinking about having a program at the state level, not just only at the federal level, but at the state level to focus on targeting in, um, meeting the needs and finding and, and engaging women veterans. And I was able to become Virginia's first women veterans full-time program manager in 2018. And, you know, that's a really good jumping off point for the discussion I'd like to have with you ladies here today. And it's basically a simple question, but a very essential one. What kind of special challenges do you think that female veterans face here in Virginia? And then again, talk about the services at both, you know, um, the um, Department of Veterans Services and the Virginia Employment Commission are offering now to help female veterans make that transition successfully into a civilian career. Um, many of the women face higher poverty rates, uh, inadequate medical services, 
higher mental health uh, issues, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, and a lack of respect um, as women veterans, just to name a few. Um, at the VC and at DVS, uh, we provide partnership resources that will help the women overcome uh, their situations uh, while assisting them with finding employment and helping them with getting their um, uh, veteran benefit services. Um, so primarily they can go to the VEC to get that employment services. And while they're working with us, those entitled benefits that they have earned while serving, they can go to the Department of Veteran Services and get those. So we work simultaneously together to help them become one whole veteran. And Beverly, a similar question for you. Obviously, the military tries to provide some of these services, you know, at least to help say separating uh, service members get going on the transition process they try to provide assistance with the various kinds of issues and concerns that Tashambi was talking about a moment ago but do you often find and i've had other guests on the podcast tell me this that many veterans when they come to you when they come to dvs they still need help with these various issues and concerns because for whatever reason, perhaps the military didn't do all it possibly could for them and the VA in some ways is coming up short. Do you find that to be kind of a common theme with many of the female veterans that you're working with? Yes, we actually do see that as a common theme and it's really difficult um, to be able to uh, really meet them right as they're transitioning. So we, we try to endeavor to be there as they uh, come out and be that safety net, that bridge that they can kind of come out of service and be able to connect with the resources. Um, sometimes we make a, a comment, there's a sea of goodwill in the community, but a lot of our, our women veterans are kind of drowning in the sea because they don't know how to navigate. They don't have someone that can pull them into the ship and say, okay, let's steer this way. Let's start with these services. You know, if they are having those issues with um, maintaining um, housing, getting them connected with, you know, at, at DVS, we have our Virginia Veterans Family Services and Supports team. We also have nonprofit community partners, Women Veterans Interactive, Final Salute, and different, uh, you know, uh, faith-based and, and, and nonprofit. We have DAV, the Disabled American Veterans, the VFWs. We have so many services and making sure that as our women veterans um, become come out of service and start to integrate into civilian life. We're here to help them navigate where they need to go and where they can go first. I remember when I was transitioning the the ACAP or the TAP services, it's like drinking from a fire hose. Mm -hmm. There's so much information. You don't know what you don't know until you're out and you're like, okay, now I need this information. Where in all of these uh, books and all of these presentations that I don't remember because I didn't know that, you know, I was supposed to pay attention to everything. Um, and now just it's all a blur. You know, it's really important for us to be kind of peer support for each other and for our women veterans as they're coming out and helping them get, be guided, you know, to the VEC with the employment um, uh uh, services. I know that the DVOP services, once I did finally find out what they did, I was able to refer so many women veterans to um, the Disabled Veteran Outreach Coordinators, and they were able to help them with resumes, get them connected with some of the employers. And then as I understood more about um, the agency I'm with, with DVS, then V3, the employers there, and then the ta uh, transition and assistance programs here. So it is really a whole lot for for our women veterans, our veterans as a whole to absorb as they're coming out because there's federal, there's state, there's nonprofit, there's the veteran service organization. So, you know, it, it has been kind of a juggling act to make sure that we help our veterans, our women veterans understand where should they start and, you know, start at a step and take it one step at a time and, and we'll walk with you the whole um, way forward. Absolutely. And I think we've got Paige back online now with us, um, kind of in the same uh, vein, Paige. We obviously have a lot of female service members here in Virginia that make that transition back to the civilian world on an annual basis. Obviously, Virginia's got a huge military population. 
for a young woman who's serving on active duty right now and they're getting out after four years, eight years, 20 years, 30 years, what kind of advice would you give them in terms of establishing a game plan for transition and accessing the services that both VEC and DVS have to offer? Gary, I would definitely tell them uh, prior to tr during their transitioning period, they definitely will need to attend TAP. Uh, at, at TAP, they will be able to get uh, a lot of resources that will help guide them through their transition period from the military to the civilian life. I, I would say research. They need to research all of their options uh, to uh, include employment and the actual community living. Um, uh, I would say they need to be self-motivated. They need to have that can-do attitude. If they're not motivated, no one else can motivate them. So they must have that self-motivation instilled. Uh, be self-confident. Uh, with that, you need to know your KSAs, your knowledge, skills, and abilities that you will bring to the forefront of the employment arena in the workforce today. And the last thing I would say is network, network, network. You need to establish that network arena while you're on active duty and getting out of the actual military. Yeah, and that will definitely help them, whether you serve two years, eight years, 20 years. Those are some of the guidelines that will enable them to be kind of sufficient in, in getting back into the workforce. That is really some solid advice, absolutely. And we we'll just have to kind of get into the next part of our discussion, talking about the Virginia Women Veterans Summit 2021 coming up here on the 23rd and 24th of June, as we mentioned earlier. It's going to be a virtual event again this year. Um, I noticed the theme of this year's summit is uh, empowered, bold with a purpose, finding clarity beyond the crisis. Explain how that theme was chosen and what it means for the participants. Okay, that theme was chosen because what we wanted to do was empower the women who are a little bit um, confused as to where they should go um, due to COVID happening. Again, COVID has set us back, you know, and had us to really look at our holistic life. So what we wanted to do is just ensure that we provide them with tools that they need to um, move forward and not sit back and think like, oh, I don't have this or I don't have that. We want to ensure that they know where to go and get the resources within the community. We want to empower them to keep moving forward. Don't uh, allow COVID to... Uh, stagger your career growth or, you know, empower those women who may be going through things because, of course, you know, some people have been in um, the house with their mate for a few months and they're kind of tired of each other, you know, and, and that's where those things like your uh, intimate partner abuse and sexual abuse comes from. And so we wanted to ensure that they have that information so that they can continue to move forward in life and not become stagnant. Now, we mentioned earlier that this is the second year in a row that due to COVID, you're having to conduct the event virtually online. Uh, hopefully you'll be back to a face-to-face -face format next year. You know, we can cross our fingers and, and hope that that does come to pass. But despite the fact that it's going to be a virtual event, once again here in 2020 or 2021, um, you've got really two full days of speakers and presentations. And Beverly, I wonder if you could maybe talk to us about some of the speakers, some of the themes of this year's summit, and some of the topics that are going to be covered during the uh, Virginia Women's Veterans Summit. So, James, I'm so excited. We're going to have two fun-filled virtual days. We are endeavoring for this these two days to be so interactive and, and just so engaging with our panel discussions. We're going to have a good couple fireside chats. We're going to talk about, you know, being interested in entrepreneurship. We're going to talk about career growth, mentorship, the importance of being mentored and the importance of 
the importance of being a protege, being an importance of being mentored and being able to really connect in the community with the right people at the right time. So I'm not going to give you all of the inside gaps because the key is we want you to join us. It's a free event. The whole community is welcome to join us because see, it, it's one thing for women veterans to talk to women veterans, but we've set this up this year where it's virtual, where we have some male veterans as speakers. So you're going to have to come on and register so you can see who they are. We have some family members joining us as speakers. We have lots and lots of women veterans that you never knew were in the level of leadership in Virginia. When I tell you, you're going to meet senators, you're going to meet uh, deputy directors of the departments of labor, you're going to see uh, uh, acting secretaries here in Virginia, and all of these will be women veterans, military spouses, and leaders right here in Virginia. So you have to join us and see what you're going to learn. And this information, even though it's going to be women veterans, it's going to be women veterans centric and focused. It's going to be such great professional development information that it's going to help you anyway. And you're going to hear it from the perspective of a woman veteran and you'll hear about women veterans. So if there were things that you were wondering, if you hadn't known before, and if you've never interacted with a woman veteran, this is the perfect opportunity, the best two days for you to come and share with us. We're not going to hold you hostage the whole two days, but we want you to pop in and pop out if you can't spend the whole two days. But I guarantee once you register and you log in with us for our opening ceremony, we're going to have the uh, national anthem sung. We're going to have po uh, poetry. We're going to have comedy. I mean, we're really going to have, a, and we're going to have maybe a virtual uh, tasting. So you really do want to join us and enjoy June 23rd and 24th. Now, if you can't, the key is to register because you will have access to the playback um, after that, but you will only have access if you register. So the key is with the link that will be shared with this podcast, please register for our event and you will be able to enjoy a once in a lifetime, I guarantee you, once in a lifetime experience with women veterans here in Virginia. Now we will certainly provide that link along with the uh, podcast once it's up on our uh, site at, at tncc.edu, also at Spotify and Anchor FM. But Paige, for someone who wants to you know, sign up today, give us the website where people can go and register to be a part of the Women's Veterans Summit coming up here in uh, June. It, it's actually three that will take you directly to the registration site. AAP.events backslash 2021 V as in Victor, uh, W as in Whiskey, V as in Victor, S as in Sierra. Or you can go straight to the DVS, uh, Department of Veterans Services webpage, or you can go directly to the Virginia Employment Commission webpage. We all have different areas where you can register, and it will definitely take you to the exact link to register. And we should point out, as Beverly mentioned earlier, this event is completely free. You're getting yes. two days of tremendous content, great speakers, panel discussions, Q&A, a chance to network virtually and everything. And it's not costing you anything. The only investment you're making really is your time. Now, Deshambi, one thing I was going to touch on, too, that Beverly had mentioned earlier you're going to have some male speakers at the summit this year. And obviously we have a lot of male military members, veterans in our audience out there. What, what's in it for the guys? You know, why should a male veteran, male military member, what will they gain by signing up and being a part of this summit? Um, what they will gain is the perspective of how a woman uh, feels uh, with her military service. They will get insight on some resources that are in the community because the resources that are in the community are not just meant for the woman veteran, it's meant for all veterans. So they'll get uh, access to that. Um, they'll get to learn about what is important to that female veteran, um, be it her career, be it her her family, um, or whether it's just something that is a hobby of hers. So there's there's a lot of information that 
they will get to hear and they'll get to hear it from a female's perspective because a lot of times in the military, uh, women aren't as vocal um, as the men. So this gives us, this platform gives us that opportunity to use our voices to speak and share our stories, our experiences, and those things that the community has to offer. And not only that, but it also gives a perspective on how we, how the military has built our livelihoods. And that's so important. Uh, Beverly, um, in looking at this year's uh, summit versus those in the past, other than the virtual format, which of course you had in, uh, in 2020 as well, how do you think this year's summit is going to be different than those that have been held in the past? This year is going to be different because we're going to have a little more multimedia interaction. We're going to have some um, some virtual live content. We're going to have some video performances, some video speakers. Um, we're going to also be able to maximize the platform. Last year, the platform only allowed us to do kind of one one way um, chatting, but this year we're going to have some virtual exhibit booths and we're going to have a virtual exhibit hall so you'll get to kind of en engage on the general main stage and then you'll get to go into the virtual exhibit hall so it's going to be really exciting to see where you have that opportunity and we'll also be able to reincorporate because we didn't do that last year reincorporate concurrent sessions so you'll have the opportunity at um, I think two or three times between our two days where there'll be multiple topics and you can choose which topics you want to go into that specific, specific um, panel session, virtual room, or, you know, uh, connect from that uh, perspective. So it's just going to be really exciting. And we've got lots of women veterans that are our colleagues at the VEC and with DVS that are excited to monitor the chat, answer all of the questions uh, that people will have and to be able to support as speakers. Because there's, I, I want to say between both agencies, over 75 to 100 women veterans that are colleagues, women veterans serving and supporting women veterans together. And we really appreciate the work that both those agencies do. And Paige, obviously the VEC and DVS, they've been really the two state agencies here in Virginia that have been the driving force behind the summit, which has been going on for a number of years, highly successful. But at the same time, you've also enlisted a number of partner organizations and sponsors. Tell us about some of those organizations that are also taking part and helping put on the event, that are providing exhibits, providing content. Yeah, and kind of talk about what they're going to be bringing to the event. Okay, Gary. So some of our partners uh, this year we have, of course, is Dominion, Dominion Virginia Power. We have Comcast. Uh, we have, give me one second. Can I throw a couple out there for okay. you, too? Absolutely. Sure? Go I'm ahead. Going, that, that, yeah. I was about to say we have DHRM. We have some other state agencies like VDOT. Um, and some, I, I like to call them our local uh, V3 uh, uh, superstars like Intellitex. Uh, we've got Com Com uh, Cox Communication along with Comcast. Um, and we're also always looking for more partners that want to support us. So that's just a taste of the few folks that have been um, legacy partners and that have come back again this year to support us. So if there's anyone out here listening that would like to um, support us this year or check us out this year, and then where we'll really need you is just like you were saying, James, when we get live again, we're going to need everyone in the room. So definitely consider, if not this year, becoming a partner um, next year to help us make a live event even more fun, even more exciting as we are able to get back together in, um, in, in, in over two years we've been <laughs> away from each other kind of thing. So that'll be so exciting. It will be. It will be. And to Shabby, to kind of dovetail on what uh, Beverly was talking about there a moment ago, um, a question will always come up. You have a lot of major corporations who were there. You mentioned Comcast. They mentioned Cox Communications. They mentioned Dominion Power. 
for a veteran or a transitioning military member who's about to get out or who's looking for a job right now, is this a place where you can bring your resume? Is this a place where you could potentially link up with a future employer and maybe, you know, utilize this as a way to get your resume package out there and maybe even look at it as a potential hiring event? Is it is it also that along with being an information type forum? Um, I would say it, it is. And the reason why I would say that is because you have the opportunities to speak to, <clears throat> excuse me, all the personnel who know what is available in that organization, they can guide you to the, the right people. Um, typically, you know, right now everyone is applying online, but however, you, you now have a contact person whom you can contact later on after leaving the event, let them know that you applied for the position, and then they can share that information forward to the correct person. So yes, it is one of those events where you can connect with the right personnel to get you that dream job that you're seeking once you're out of the military. And in that same vein, Beverly, along with networking with respective employers out there, what are some of the other groups and organizations that a veteran that's taking part in this summit, you know, what are some of the, of the other networking opportunities that are going to take place and be available during this event? So we've got some phenomenal nonprofit and resource providers. So we're going to be looking at folks like Tech for Troops. Um, that's an organization that uh, assists veterans, especially student veterans, with getting laptops if they don't have laptops for school. We have Women's Veteran Interactive, which is one of the very few veteran service organizations organizations focused on women veterans, by women veterans, for women veterans needs. Um, then we have some of our classic VSOs. Uh, this is Disabled American Veterans, the VFW, the Veterans of Foreign Wars. That's going to be um, also attending and, and providing support. Um, some of the other groups that I really love to highlight have the historical impact. So the Army Women's Museum is here in Fort Lee, and they always join us and share great stories, historical impact of Army women. And then we have the Military Women's Memorial that speak to all women in all branches of service, and they'll be doing something um, really special, speaking to the eras of women veterans in service and the diversity of women veterans in service, just to name a few. Of course, we're going to have our VA um, partners, the Center for Women Veterans, will join us, and we're hoping that we'll be able to have a lot more other guests like the Red Cross and, and some of those other folks to join us, maybe not on the main stage, but in our in exhibitor hall, um, our virtual exhibitor hall. But obviously a lot of opportunities there for participants to connect with service organizations, potential employers. And again, that alone would make it you know worth the investment of your time for a couple of days coming up here in June. In fact, the 23rd and 24th when it's going to take place. One thing I was going to ask you uh, while we're discussing issues facing female veterans here in Virginia, Page, we've often heard that even though Virginia has a huge military population, about the third, I think it's the third largest active duty population in the country, we in looking at the people that leave the service here in the Commonwealth, about 70% actually leave the state and go somewhere else. Do you find that trend also holds up among the female veteran population that the majority of women who leave the military here in Virginia will actually wind up going somewhere else? Uh, yes, Gary, we do find that true as well. And do you have any, any thoughts as to why that is? I mean, Virginia has a lot to offer, obviously, but yet we're seeing roughly three-quarters of our veterans, both male and female, leaving the Commonwealth and going somewhere else. And, you know, the obvious question becomes, what can we as a state, what can we as state agencies do to convince more of these transitioning military members to stay here in Virginia and keep their talents and their abilities and their gifts working for the state and working for the population here? Well, Gary, you're going to find some of them, a portion of that uh, percentage uh, is married to a, a significant other that is also in the military. That's so, a very good point. Uh, of course, that's going to be a, a, a main concern. They're going to follow their significant other. Uh, you may look at uh, the cost of living. That's another 
major point for the state of Virginia. Of course, you know, we have a lot of taxes and the taxes are high. So that is a major issue there. Uh, I would say, and this is Paige, <laughs> Uh, Virginia needs to invest more into the infrastructure as far as the workforce. Uh, they need to be competitive with salaries. Salaries is another issue. Of course, you know females are paid less than their male counterparts. So salaries need to be reviewed when it comes to women vets and vets, period. Um, again, uh, education, that's another issue. Uh, their home of record. Some some people like to go back to their home of record. Uh, sure. Again, Virginia, the actual tax rate it is extremely extremely high. So that's kind of sort of discouraging for especially a retiree. You hear this a lot, Gary. You know they're gonna go to a state, i.e., Florida, where they don't have to pay any taxes on their retirement. So, or a state like North Carolina, which has a state income tax, but if you're a military retiree, like I am, your military pension is not taxed by the state. And that makes it very right. attractive. And it's sad to say here in Virginia, they've looked at it and they determined that somehow it would take something like 30 years to recoup the revenue that, they're, that they would lose by not taxing military pensions. So if you're a military retiree here in Virginia and you're looking for a tax break on your pension from the state, uh, it's probably not going to happen anytime soon. So right, you have right. to look for other incentives and reasons. And in fairness, there are plenty of reasons, plenty of incentives for a military retiree, veteran, transitioning service member, male or female, to stay here in Virginia. Yes. Uh, one of you yeah, mentioned yeah. education. The employment opportunities are here mm-hmm. compared to other places around the country. Right. And that's one of the great things about events like the uh, Women's Summit coming up here next month. It really brings a lot of these elements together and allows a veteran to take a look at, you know, the whole um, puzzle, basically, and, uh, you know, make an informed decision, you know, um uh, and sometimes, you know, connecting with that potential employer, connecting with a support network will be enough right. to say, if, for someone to say that, you know, Virginia may be a pretty good place for me after all. And keep them right. here in the Commonwealth, keep those talents and abilities here, you know, working for us here in the state, working for the population, making Virginia a better place to live. Now, to Shelby, I should mention one thing. We I think we touched on this earlier. For individuals who are not able to spend some time attending the summit virtually next month, is there going to be an opportunity for them to go back and review or or see an archived copy and and play it back later on on their own time? Yes, as long as they register. Um, That is the key to getting that information. You must register in order to get that link where you can review that missed information. Um, and, and it's important that they, they register because not only are they getting that information, but we are getting to know who you are. And that way we can reach out to you and provide you some information about the organizations that are there. So there, there are resources links that you can also get from registering, not only just getting the uh, playback but you're getting also resources. Just out of curiosity, how many folks have signed up so far and how many veterans, male and female, do you expect to take part in the summit next month? So if you don't mind, I'll jump in here. We're almost um, a little over 500 registered, but our stretch goal, our desire, our hope is to have up to 1,500 women veterans, community partners, family members, military spouse, male veterans, all veterans join us because it is open to the community and it is free. So it would be an amazing thing for, you know, use word of mouth, use social media, send out emails, do a smoke signal if you can, so that we can get (laughs) as many folks in the know about joining us for this event. Um, Last year, so when we were live, we were actually able to get over 800 women veterans community partners in 
the Hamptons Convention Center in 2019. Last year, we were able to get up to about 1,300 registered. So that's why we're over here stretching our goals. And we really believe that we can reach out um, to 1,500 because the cool thing last year also was we didn't only have Virginia joining us. We had 30 other states joining in with us because we're one of the only states that had a virtual women veterans conference last year because things went a little uh, sideways because of COVID. A lot of folks just canceled their events and didn't have anything. Well, Virginia here, we, VEC and DVS pushed it out together and did a virtual. And so everyone joined us. And so the key is I'm going to join Ohio because they're doing it this year for the first time. I'm going to join California, but I'm inviting everyone to come and join us here in Virginia again. And again, we will do everything we can here on the podcast to uh, promote the uh, Women's Summit coming up on 23, 24 June. In fact, if you're listening to this podcast, please help us spread the word. Uh, We'll have the uh, website, the registration uh, portal here for you in just a second. But again, as Beverly indicated, this is a really valuable, in many ways, a unique event, something that has continued despite the onslaught of COVID, and it's a really wonderful opportunity for veterans of all genders to access uh, services, meet up with community partners, maybe even, again, connect with a company that may help them land that dream job at some point down the road. So, Paige, once again, please tell us how someone can sign up for the Virginia Women's Veterans Summit coming up here on 23 and 24 June. Okay, Gary. Uh, Let me first of all say this is a partnership between the Department of Veterans Services and the Virginia Employment Commission. Uh, They can go to, again, aap.events backslash 2021, VS and Victor, WS and Whiskey, VS and Victor, SS and C era. They can also come directly to the Department of Veterans Services website and the Virginia Employment Commission's website and click on those links and they can go ahead and register for the event on the 23rd and the 24th of June. Outstanding. And I'm going to also give you ladies a chance to get in your own um, plug for how folks can reach you at both the DVS in the case of Beverly and at the uh, VEC in the case of Shambi and Paige. So Beverly, we'll let you go first. If someone has questions about uh, services for female veterans, for veterans in general, available through the Department of Veterans Services, how can they contact you? Absolutely. Reach us at www.dvs.virginia.gov. When you go to the main page, you'll see all of our services. You'll see benefits. You'll see the Virginia uh, Family Support. You'll see the War Memorial. You will see Women Veterans on that opening page. You click on Women Veterans, you'll be able to see also the link that page just mentioned. So you can click on it there and you will also see a a link that will allow you to make an appointment where we will call you back within 24 to 48 hours uh, with to help you through your questions or you can also sign up for our news you can use periodic newsletter. We do not spam you every week. We do not send you something every month. We send you something when something is going on. So you can put it on your calendar and keep it moving because we understand as women veterans, we're busy. We do not have time to mess with the spam. So we send you what you need at that moment. We also can be reached at the Virginia Department of Veteran Services on YouTube, on LinkedIn, and on Facebook. You will be able to follow us and get updates. Oh, and also Twitter. And you'll be able to follow us, get updates, and all of the links and pictures and great things that we'll be sharing. We're going to have some great giveaways that's going to be connected to your social media connectivity. So it's always great to get connected with it now. So you'll be right in place for those giveaways. Thank you so much. You bet. You bet. Tashami, for folks who want to reach you at the VEC, what's the best way to contact you, ma'am? Um, they can reach us at our um, email link, which is veteran.services at vec.virginia.gov, or they can go to our webpage, which is www.vec.virginia.gov backslash veterans. Okay, and Paige, how can folks reach you at the VEC? 
Again, Gary, the same email address that Tashambi uh, just put out, veteran.services at vec.virginia.gov. And they can, again, come to our main webpage at uh, the vec.virginia.gov and hit veterans. Outstanding. Okay, we have been talking with uh, Paige Glass and Tashambi Hall of the Virginia Employment Commission and with Beverly Van Toll of the Department of Veterans Services here in Virginia, and we've been speaking about the Virginia Women's Veterans Summit, which is coming up here on 23 and 24 June. It's going to be a virtual event once again due to COVID this year, but again, it's going to be two days of tremendous content, great speakers, panel discussions, and a chance again for participants, male, female, to do some networking and again to access the services that can maybe help them take that next step in their career. Ladies, thank you all for your time today. We deeply appreciate it. Thank you, Gary, for having us. Our pleasure. Thank you very much. This has been At Ease, the military podcast of Thomas Nelson Community College. I'm Gary Pounder from the military team here at TNCC. Thanks for listening.